And so science takes off for the stars. Religion stays where it is, and, but it builds a kind of wall around itself to keep science out. And there's a kind of unspoken compact between science and religion. And religion is saying, science is saying, OK, you don't burn us at the stake anymore. You, know, you let us do what we do to understand nature. And we'll seed that feeling of wonder. We'll seed the goosebumps to you, that feeling of oneness. And I think that this has been a failure of the scientific community, that for too long, it was, too, it was unusual for the scientist to speak about how our knowledge of the natural world creates, has certain ethical, moral, and spiritual implications. And so there's this kind of, you know, people will, I, I'm not even sure what the word scientism really means. I, the way it was used earlier confused me. But I don't see how you can understand that there are 400 billion suns in this galaxy alone, each perhaps at the rate that we're finding extrasolar planets, each perhaps with a retinue of 100 worlds. And then go back to a book that talks of the world, when this is but one galaxy in, so many other, in a universe of so many galaxies. There's a kind of, it's impossible to still read that book and not think that it's very earthbound in its conception of nature. And so that wonderful impulse that my grandfather had, I mean, he was so obviously devoted and true to what he believed. If he had had access to this wider cosmos that science has revealed, then I believe that he would have found new means of expression for his devotion and for his soulfulness. And I think that's what, what's happened to me, is to discover the world that science reveals, is to very much um, want to experience the transcendent, not give that up, but not do it by lying to myself about what it should be about, but instead take nature itself. I mean, the idea of a religion that's not rooted in nature or a philosophy that's not rooted in what we know about nature it seems antithetical to the purpose of philosophy and of religion. I'd like to talk about uh, one little experiment in cooperation between these often contentious views of existence. And that is uh, the American Humanist Association in Florida came to me two years ago, three years ago, and said that they had, um, that they wanted to start, they wanted to apply for a charter for the first charter school in American history that would be a public humanist school. And they were going up against two fundamentalist Christian schools in Hillsborough County, Florida. And they wanted to call the school the Carl Sagan Academy. And, um, read the charter, which was really impressive, joined forces with them. And we did go up against two fundamentalist schools. And the amazing thing is, um, is that the American humanists had gone to every Baptist preacher in Hillsborough County and said, you know, we don't believe in God, but we'd like to give your children a state-of-the-art education in math and science critical thinking, history of science, to break the cycle of poverty in Hillsborough County. We'd like your kids to be able to compete with kids anywhere in the country. And we enlisted the support of every single Baptist minister in Hillsborough County, went before the school board. The two fundamentalist charters were defeated, and our charter was accepted. And so we've been in existence for two years now. Our student body is entirely African American. If we uh, survive to the third year, which looks like we will, we'll begin to get federal funding. We are, uh, we, we are the most improved school in Hillsborough County. Unfortunately, because of the abomination called No Child Left Behind, uh, our curriculum, instead of being as science-centered as we hoped it would be, 
um, is, uh, we're, you know, we're really playing catch up because of the testing, the chronic testing on rote memorization that has become the, the curriculum of the American public school system. So I just want to say that when the earlier speaker was talking about popular books and having been a participant in probably one of the most successful worldwide efforts at popularization of public science education ever done, I, thought, I felt very deeply resentful because there seemed to be a disconnect between one of his slides in which he decried popularization as being you know, a distortion of science uh, and the other slide in which he talked about being nice to the public because they pay for science when, in fact, because of the state of, a, of public education, it's only these efforts at popular education because of the price also of higher education in this country and the fact that people who want to go to higher education uh, but who don't have the money um, are effectively in, in putting themselves in indebtedness for the rest of their lives if they attempt to do so. These attempts, these books, uh, uh, popular science books and popular science television programs are one of the few efforts at breaking down that, that wall around science, which has been so effective so that we have a society completely dependent on science and high technology, and yet we have just a tiny number of people who understand the values and the method and the language of science, which in a country that, or society that aspires to be a democracy is an absolute disaster. Um, the gratification of the Cosmos television series, the number of people who have seen it worldwide, we have just made it available in Urdu. Um, we, it's now available in something like 40 languages worldwide. It's been seen by a billion people domestically in the United States. The month of October was one of the largest sales, months of, uh, of largest sales uh, in the history of the Cosmos television series. That's, it's 27 years old. These have been 27 of the most uh, eventful and fertile years in the history of science. How can it be that a science television series done in 1980 is still so compelling to so many people, more than actually than it was in 1980? I believe that it's due in large part to the greatness of Carl Sagan, his ability to express with clarity complex subjects without cutting the corners on the science, his desire to communicate, not to impress anyone with his learnedness, but most of all, that combination of skepticism and wonder. None, not one ever at the expense of the other, but each equally powerful. That is a very potent combination. It, uh, in fact, it's the most powerful thing I know. And so I think it's really good for us to engage each other. I've enjoyed these talks uh, over the last uh, 48 hours. I've learned a tremendous amount, I've been stimulated, provoked, uh, inspired. And I want to thank Roger. And I certainly want to thank everyone involved, all of the people who worked on making this conference possible for all of us. I think it's great for us to, to, to do these things. I just hope that, uh, that we are on the eve of a swing in the pendulum, that tomorrow we'll wake up and we'll realize that our fellow citizens have been aroused from their stupor from their fear-based religion and their fear-based politics to see what we have to do to make this tiny, very tiny, pale blue dot a place of peace and true goodness. Thank you.